where does narcissism come from and is there a, a, a big role in that um, in terms of upbringing? Um, pathological narcissism is distinct from healthy narcissism. Mm -hmm. um, it's considered to be the, widely considered to be the outcome of uh, early childhood abuse during the formative years between zero and six, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. But the word abuse is, is widely misunderstood. Uh, abuse doesn't only mean the classical forms, mm -hmm. which are touted about, like sexual abuse or physical abuse, verbal, psychological abuse. Mm -hmm. But abuse means any situation where the parent refuses to allow the child to separate from the parent mm -hmm. and to individuate, to become an individual. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, using the, leveraging the child or using the child to realize the parent's unfulfilled wishes, dreams and fantasies is a form of abuse. Conditioning love on performance is a form of abuse. Pampering, uh, spoiling, uh, inculcating, inculcating a sense of entitlement, uh, incommensurate with achievements and efforts, it's a form of abuse. In all these situations, the parent merges and fuses with the child. The child is treated as an extension of the parent. Mm -hmm. Obviously, sexual abu abuse is the same. With sexual abuse, physical abuse, these, these are breaches of boundaries. This is a refusal to recognize the separateness and autonomy of the child. Now, a tiny, a small minority of children react by actually internalizing the abuser. There's a kind of inner monologue that says, well, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. Henceforth, I'm going to be the abuser. I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the big, scary guy. I'm not going to be the small, scared kid. Mm -hmm. And the child does that by <coughs> concocting, concocting a piece of fiction. Uh, so, and the false self is everything the child is not. The child is is helpless. The false self is omnipotent. The child cannot predict his parents' behavior. The false self is omniscient or knowing. Mm -hmm. The child is told by his parents that he is a bad, unworthy object. Uh, the false self is perfect and brilliant. And of course, if you make a list, if you list down all the attributes and properties of the false self, you discover that we are talking about God. Mm -hmm. So in essence, narcissism is a form of private religion with a single worshipper and a godhead invented by the worshipper. And the worshipper is a narcissist, of course. Mm -hmm. That's more or less in a mm -hmm. nutshell. But this is the, this is the pathology. That's mm -hmm. the clinical entity on the individual level. What has happened is that we have begun, since the 1970s, we have begun to realize that narcissism, pathological narcissism, is an organized, societal and cultural organizing principle, an explanatory dimension. It helps us to make sense of the world. It imbues the world with meaning. So we can use narcissism to explain to ourselves many things, to predict many things. And, uh, and so we began, we began to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. So that, that's the social dimension of narcissism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now moving this into the sphere of, of internet, um, you, I noticed that on your website you've written, the internet is the ideal playpen for the narcissist and in fact psychopaths. So why is it the ideal playpen for them? Well, first of all, the internet allows for anonymity. That's the primal, the primal scene of the internet. Mm -hmm. The internet has never been regulated as it should have been from the very beginning. And so it, it came uh, free for all, where people can pretend to be who they are not. Mm -hmm. Now, there is, um, narcissists have an advantage at pretending to be who they are not, because they have the false self. From a very early age, they have been, narcissists pretend that they are not who they are. Mm -hmm. So this element of anonymity, this element of role play, this element, this thespian element of acting, allows the narcissist to leverage the, their strong points, their fortes. That's one thing. Second thing, um, the the internet um, is not does not allow for real interactions in the sense that when you meet another person face to face, you usually absorb an inordinate, inordinate amount of information. Um, unconsciously, via body language, even smell, um, you know, many things. Mm -hmm. All these, all this extraneous data is excluded um, in any and all internet interactions. 
And this allows, of course, for manipulation. Because it's very difficult to manipulate this if a vast amount of data is out of your control. In other, consider, for example, a con artist. A, there, are, there, are, but there are bodily tells. You, you kind of intuitively spot when the other person is lying. Mm -hmm. uh, via his body language and 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 uh, and so on. So, but, but this is absent in the internet. So manipulation is much easier, and that's the second point which attracts uh, narcissists and, and psychopaths. The internet is also a magical kingdom where where um, infantile fantasies, grandiose especially, uh, are easily realizable. You can easily easily realize them. Mm -hmm. So. People are attracted to the internet because it's the land of unlimited possibilities. It's kind of the an inverted American dream or malignant American dream, oh. so to speak. That's so, <laughs> so there's a lot of magical thinking uh, going on, a lot of pretensions and so on. The fourth element is that is confirmation bias. Internet creates silos of like-minded people. Narcissists prey on that. Narcissists leverage this like-mindedness and this. Um, um, inability to to assimilate and to process uh, countervailing information, contradictory information. So, uh, in monocultures, the narcissist is the virus. We know that when we have monocultures of plants and of organisms, they are much much more susceptible to bacterial and viral infection, and they're much more susceptible because the immunological system doesn't have a chance to be exposed to you know a variety of pathogens. And this is exactly the situation on the internet. The internet is a patch of monocultures, a patch of silos like, of like-minded people who refuse adamantly to be exposed to pathogens, so to speak. And so the narcissist takes advantage of this by pretending to be one of the gang, a member of the privileged, um, and with access, access to the arcane language that they often develop. And so conspiracy theories... Um, a radical uh, political um, political radicalism um, activism uh, radicalism masquerading as activism and all and all these things attract narcissists and psychopaths because they can ride the wave of gullibility and the wave of rage and aggression and which leads me to the fifth point the internet is a place for unbridled aggression it's actually it actually rewards aggression there's positive reinforcement where uh, with aggression, for aggression. So, narcissists and psychopaths are adept at using aggression, structured aggression, to obtain goals where other people are not. So, they play around. Mm -hmm. they, it's it's a wonderful space for them. Mm -hmm. And they congregate the, the gravity towards the internet. Mm. And I suppose what you were just saying that it kind of links into social media, doesn't it? Um, is that like another tool basically for them to use? Um, you know, the internet began, there was no social media, now more recently there is. Does it just give it's, them more options? It's not an accident, of course, that when the internet had begun, there were no social media. There was no technological barrier to social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could have been, it could have been invented, or they could have been invented, mm -hmm. as early as essentially 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were not. Mm -hmm. They were invented 10 years later. And the reason they were invented 10 years later is especially what I've just is 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 especially because of what I've just said. Mm -hmm. The internet had attracted over these 10 years narcissists and psychopaths to cater to their needs, to the needs of increasingly more narcissistic people. It's an epidemic. To cater to their needs, the, te the technology caught up with this. So there was a cultural and societal trend, a congregation a center of gravity for narcissists and psychopaths, known as the internet, and then clever minds picked up on it and said, well, you know, here are all these people. This is their profile. They are grandiose. They lack uh, empathy. They are not very good with intimacy. Uh, they regulate their sense of self-worth from the outside, so they need narcissistic supply all the time. Uh, they are attention seekers, etc., etc., etc. Here's the profile. Let us build a technological tool to cater to this profile. Mm -hmm. So social media did not invent narcissism. It's, it's riding the wave crest of narcissism. It's surfing narcissism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what are the most common behaviors of, um, of narcissists on social media, where you can tell that these people are narcissists, the way they use it? Well, here's the thing. Social media was designed 
to foster, engender, enhance, and amplify Nazism. Mm -hmm. It is therefore impossible to say, uh, to distinguish narcissists from non narcissists The thing is, the minute you exit social media sphere or social media space, you become a narcissist. Mm -hmm. uh, you are forced to become a narcissist, even if you don't want to. For example, by posting anything whatsoever, you invite likes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever ask yourself why you cannot disable likes? I mean, imagine. It's a technology. What's the problem? It should be able to allow you to post anything you want and disable likes. Mm -hmm. But there is no such button. You cannot disable likes. So the technology was designed um, ab initio from the beginning to encourage and foster narcissism. Now, think about, think about it. I mean, let's go through the logics. The business model of social media is monetized advertising, monetized targeted advertising. So they need your time. They need your eyeballs. They need your eyeballs on the screen. Anything that competes with screen time is the enemy of social media. So if you have a girlfriend or if you have a family, they are the enemies of social media because they take away your eyeballs from the screen. It's, it's, uh, everyone will deny it. Zuckerberg will deny it vehemently. But it is the truth because mm -hmm. they need your, your eyeballs on this Facebook screen mm -hmm. for them to make money. Yeah. And it's all about money, of course. Had it not been about money, Facebook would have been a charity mm -hmm. or would not have listed in the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. um, NASDAQ, I'm sorry. But they have. So it's all about money, obviously. Mm -hmm. And if it is all about money, they need to become, they need to monopolize your time to the exclusion of all else. Now, how to do that? How to monopolize your time? Well, one way of monopolizing your time is relative positioning, getting you invo involved in a competitive environment where you constantly compare yourself to others. And not only compare yourself, compare yourself to others, but compare yourself, compare yourself to your previous selves. So, for example, if I made a post early this morning and there were 1,000 likes uh, and the next post has only 500 likes, I feel bad. I'm competing with myself, actually. It makes me feel bad. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if, if you make a post and I make a post and you get 1,200 likes, it makes me feel bad as well. Social media create what we call ego dystony. Ego dystony means they constantly make you feel bad, not good, bad. And this, uh, uh, this envy, pathological envy, this, um, it, this is uh, encouraged via the mechanisms of ranking. The social media actually ranks you constantly. And this bad feeling, this ego dystony leads you to action. We know that when people, in, in, when people experience what we call dissonance, when they experience an inner conflict between two competing needs, two competing values, two competing beliefs, and two competing pieces of information, they try to resolve the dissonance very frequently via action. So social media, media encourage you to act mm -hmm. by creating a constant feeling of anxiety and a constant background depression, what is known as cyclothemia or dysthemia. These are, these, what I'm telling you is not speculation. I encourage, I encourage you to view the recent interviews with uh, engineers, retired engineers from Facebook, Google, Twitter, and so on. And you will discover that they are saying exactly the same things. They're saying, we designed the platforms to be addictive. And we, we designed the platforms to encourage aggression and so on and so forth. They are saying it. Mm. So, so they create this dissonance. They create envy via ranking, relative position. That's the first thing. The second thing they do, they capitalize on something that was discovered in 1939 by Don Dallard. And it's the frustration, frustration aggression hypothesis. Dallard said that if you're frustrated, you're very likely to convert your frustration into aggression. And this aggression is likely to be either overt, in which case you'll become a bully or whatever, or 
covert, in which case you will become passive aggressive. Now, social media capitalize on this insight into human nature. They encourage you to be ag aggressive by providing um, anonymity, by providing, by not penalizing people who are aggressive, by avoiding regulation, censorship, and moderation. Before social media came on the scene, there were other massive groups of people interacting with each other. I personally ran a support group with 250,000 people. So it's not like social media invented mass interaction on the internet. But as opposed to all previous forms of interaction, social media had been the first to not offer any kind of intervention or moderation. In my forum, there were moderators, dozens of them. You know, on Wikipedia, now there are moderators. I mean, there are moderators everywhere. People who make sure that no boundaries are transcended, that no fake news are disseminated, that no misinformation is, is preferred and promulgated, that people don't attack each other, that they don't slander, that they don't libel, etc., etc., etc. Civilized, a civilized code of behavior, which used to be called netiquette. Social media, for example, do not have netiquette. So they were free for all, kill zones, absolute kill zones, designed as kill zones. And um, they encourage aggression. Now, the thing with aggression, it is self-propagating and self-feeding. The more aggressive you are, the more likely you are to be aggressive because uh, aggression leads to frustration, especially online. Let me try to explain. If you go to a bar and someone pesters you and uh, mocks you, you can get up from your seat and punch, punch him in the face. At that moment, your aggression is gone, together with your frustration. You may end up in prison or county jail, but you still got rid of your aggression and frustration. This is not possible online because your aggression can be met with counter-aggression and there's nothing you can do about it. Or even worse, your aggression can be ignored, which creates frustration, which creates added aggression. And this, of course, is known as flame wars. This is the essence of flame wars. Mm -hmm. So, so aggression, frustration on the internet is infinite. It's an infinite loop. It can never, ever be broken. Now think about it for a minute from the point of view of eyeballs. The more you are frustrated, the more aggressive you are, the more you are drawn to return to the scene of the crime. If you posted aggressively on a thread, you will keep revisiting this thread in order to see what are the reactions. And then once there are reactions, you will react or respond to the reactions, which will make you visit and revisit the place again and again. So frustration, aggression creates what we call in internet parlance, creates stickiness. They encourage you, they encourage repeat use, which is exactly why they were incorporated. Now consider, for example, Twitter. Twitter is supposed to be the more benign of all these platforms, but it is not. It is actually, if we use, if we use a scatological uh, religious terms, it is the most evil of all of them. Um, Twitter started with a character limit of 140 characters. Now, when you talk to people online and tell them that this was a design choice, a technology choice, they say, no, it wasn't. It's simply that Twitter wanted input via SMS. They wanted input via text messages, and text messages were limited to 140 characters. So that's why Twitter limited itself to 140 characters. But of course, <laughs> it's an idiotic answer. The question is, why did they choose SMS as the input mechanism? Why, for example, didn't they choose email, which at the time was even more all-pervasive than SMS? Why did they choose a, a technological solution that limited the number of characters. Well, we have a hint. One of the founders of Twitter admitted online that the reason was to restrict emotional expression. The thing is that we know from psychology that the more you restrict speech, the more you create aggression. 
we, I mean, someone who came from Poland would understand that mm. because Poland was subjected to military rule. Mm. And under military rule, there's censorship. And under censorship, there's a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. Censorship and anger go together. <clears throat> and on Twitter, there is censorship inbuilt. Number of characters used to be. Now they change the rules, but used to be. And this, of course, created a lot of aggression. And aggression created stickiness, repeat use. All these platforms, all these platforms were designed to leverage, use, and amplify the absolute worst aspects of the internet. In this sense, they were all they are all malicious technologies. And and believe me, I am the furthest person on earth from conspiracy theories. I detest and abhor conspiracy theories. But everything I've told you is backed up by testimonies, interviews, and articles written by the very people who created these technologies, most of them engineers. Mm -hmm. Last thing that I would like to say, and then, of course, open to questions, mm -hmm. is you should absolutely consider the profile of the people who came up with social media. Pretending that social media came out of the blue um, from some kind of abstract, uh, in some kind of abstract environment is wrong. All social media were created by men. Men are much more aggressive than women. All social media were created by white men. White men are much more aggressive than non-white men. Most social media, not all, most social media were created by people whom we describe in psychology as schizoids, people whose social skills are, shall we say gently, challenged. Loners, coders, programmers. Um, these people have a, a very typical profile in psychology. They created the technology in their own in their own form and shape. This technology is not social by any stretch of the word. It's asocial. It's an atomizing technology. It's technology for loners. It's technology for people who sit facing a tiny screen. And it is exclusively via this screen that they interact with other people. Introverts, schizoids, loners, recluses, men, white, sexually inept. That's the profile. Mm -hmm. And people who have difficulty with intimacy and difficulty with human interaction and who derive their sense of self-worth by via interaction with peers who are equal-minded. We know that all these coders and programmers and as were essentially a variant of hackers, hackers in the good sense, hackers, people who knew the technology well. And hackers, hackers <coughs> congregated in communities, in insular, insular communities. There were insular communities of hackers um, online and still are. So it's not that social media came, you know, where it was created by a committee, a representative committee where there were blacks and whites and men and women of all ages, of all socioeconomic strata and background, it's not true. It was created by rich, white kids who were schizoids and socially inept and atomized loners. Mm -hmm. And the technology is that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the, the narrative being put out now really is that here is this social media that was created and it's being abused in this way, whereas you're saying, no, actually, this, the whole structure of this social media was designed for it to be used in this way, but they're now trying to tell people, no, no, that, that people are using it wrong and they're abusing it. But just to go back to um, the actual sort of... Narcissism. Just to comment, yeah? just to comment sure. what you have said. Sure. Obviously, under political pressure, and right now there's a lot of a lot of heat on on Facebook and others. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Under political pressure, they will come up with a narrative that we meant well. I mean, we were well intentioned. That it became a war zone is not our fault. We invented the dynamite uh, to blow up mountains uh, for mining operations. That people are using it to kill each other is not our fault. <laughs> Alfred Nobel didn't think so. That's why he invented the Nobel Prize. He tried to atone and repent. You are responsible for what happens to your technology, especially if you make marketing and other choices which direct its growth and development. But 
it's also a lie. I mean, to start with, it's a lie. For example, Facebook was created initially to be a social media gateway for rich white um, uh, students, rich white students. Initially, Facebook was not open to the public. It's a chapter in their history that is absolutely effaced and erased in the official histories released by Facebook. But Facebook at the very beginning was limited to white students who were also members of Phi Beta Kappa and so on. In other words, wealthy white students. So hmm. that's utter nonsense to say that it was developed as a public policy tool to connect all the peoples of the world. Hmm. It's This came later because it sounds good and went well with the IPO on NASDAQ. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's something I didn't know. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of play uh, devil's advocate um, with in terms of the narcissist himself, and to actually go back to the the person himself. So because I know, um, you know, you talk about likes that people are competing with themselves. They're putting things up there because they want to receive likes. They're looking for approval, kind of thing. Um, I also uh, saw one of your lectures where at the beginning where when the audience walked in, you actually ignored them for a little while. Um, and then later you, you mentioned that you ignored them uh, and it was kind of a, a strange feeling for them. You know, it doesn't feel nice to be ignored. Um, and I wanted to ask, I mean, do people have some kind of a natural uh, need for attention in them? Um, that it, if they do get approval, if they do get likes, you know, if someone doesn't ignore them, they feel like you know they're alive, or they feel like they're making an impact, uh, and people generally naturally need that. Or, or is it, or is it more about narcissism, and that a lot of people are just you know they love themselves, and that's why they need the attention, and that's why they need to feel they're making an impact. Or, or is it kind of a natural thing that we have that in ourselves that if we do get ignored enough times, if nobody likes anything that we've posted, we feel like well, what's the point? Of even being in this world if no one's interacting with me, if no one's re reacting to anything I've done? Let's start with a basic fact. Mm -hmm. If I were to ignore you for a lengthy period of time, you will become self-conscious. Mm -hmm. You will actually experience your existence on a heightened level. You will experience it much more. Um, why? Why is that? Because you need to be seen. If I don't provide this function, if I don't see you, you will begin to see yourself. You will kind of lick your wounds. You will self-nurture. And the reason is that as babies, if we are not seen, we are dead. There are two situations, two, two possible. It's a binary state. Or we are seen, or we are dead. Because for a baby to be, to be um, fed, to be clothed, to be sheltered, to be nurtured, the baby needs to be seen, obviously. That's why babies cry. They want to be seen. So from a very early age, we identify being seen with being alive. And up to a certain age, up to four years old, shall we say, it's also true. If we're not seen, we die. So, and then obviously it becomes a feature of our mental apparatus. We need to be seen. Now the need to be seen has two levels. On one level, we need to be seen and that's healthy, because that's the foundation of our sense of, our sense of self-worth, which is comprised of our self-esteem and self-confidence. So without being seen, without the gaze of others, we cannot construct a proper, calibrated sense of self-worth. So the gaze of others is critical as a regulatory input. We call it feedback. Uh, but then it can transcend this and become malignant. It becomes malignant where in the absence of such a gaze for a relatively short period of time, you are unable to regulate your sense of self-worth. For example, you become depressed or you begin to think of yourself as unworthy, as bad, as a failure, a loser. So when you're not able to regulate internally your self-confidence and self-esteem, but you, you, are, you become addicted to, dependent on, crucially, input from the outside, it is then that we talk about pathological narcissism. Now, what happens um, in social media is that it enhances and engenders the, the second kind, not the first kind. Because 
The difference between the two is this. Feedback which assists and substantiates healthy narcissism contains information. So, for example, you will ask me, how was my lecture? I will tell you, listen, your lecture was great, but at this, this point you made a mistake and you should have stood to the left. And, you know, I would give you information. All positive, all feedback that sustains healthy narcissism, uh, self-esteem and self-confidence, etc., contains information. What information is contained in a like on Facebook? None. And that's precisely the hallmark of pathological narcissism. In pathological narcissism, there is also feedback, but the, the feedback is empty, does not contain information. The only information about the feedback is the feedback. It's like, uh, what's the definition of a celebrity? Someone who is famous for being famous. So it's an empty, empty uh, gesture. And so then we become dependent on the very act of feedback, not on its content, but on its existence. And then if we are not seen, what happens is we try to nurture ourselves. That, you would agree, is an excellent description of narcissism. Mm -hmm. When we are not seen, we become narcissists because we need to feed ourselves and to see ourselves in the absence of external feedback. So the thing is that likes on Facebook and so on and so forth are essentially the equivalent of not being seen because they don't contain information. They feed your pathological narcissism to some extent, but they feel vacuous. They feel empty. They feel wrong somehow. And so your hunger for being seen is not sated or sated only artificially. So in this sense, it is junk food. It's like the difference between junk food and nutritious food. In both cases, your stomach feels full, but usually in the case of junk food, you would need to eat very frequently and you would become obese. So it's pathological. And it's the same, it's the same here. When you don't get likes, you have two options. You can say, I'm a bad, unworthy, failure, loser, nobody, non-entity of a person. How many people would say that? Extremely few. The common reaction is to say, people are stupid. They don't know how to appreciate me. They are attention uh, span challenged. They are idiots. They are, I mean, the common reaction is what we call alloplastic defense tending to blame others, tending to ascribe misbehavior, guilt, and shame to others, projecting your inner dissonance, your inner conflict, your unease, your discomfort onto others and blaming them for having engendered these feelings in you. How do we call this? We call this aggression. So when you are not seen the response is aggression. And this is exactly 1939 Dullard's work. Frustration leads to aggression. And so we would, there are the two classic hallmarks of pathological narcissism are there. One, the tendency to blame others for, fail, or for our failures and defeats. We call it alloplastic defense, which of course cannot go hand in hand with empathy. So if you need constantly to blame others for your mishaps and failures and so on, you can't have empathy. So it's a disempathic reaction. And the second thing is when you are not seen sufficiently and no one is seen sufficiently, even if you have a million likes, you tend to nurture yourself. You tend to cultivate yourself. You tend to withdraw. And this is pathological narcissism. You tend to invest emotionally in yourself rather than in others. And this process is called cathexis. So you tend to, uh, you tend to become self-centered in the full sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> you've kind of touched on this, um, but I, I'll just ask you, because uh, I know you use social media. Um, do you use it in a narcissistic way? Um, and how does one use it in a non-narcissistic way, if that's even possible? Because I know you say it was generally designed in such a way that there's only, you know, 
one way to use it. But is it possible to use it on a daily basis in a non-narcissistic way? And would you say that that's how you use it or do you use it in a narcissistic way as well? No, I use it exclusively in non-narcissistic way. Mm -hmm. Exclusively. I, for example, disseminate only information. I um, delete uh, all comments that have a personal angle, mm -hmm. even if they are extremely positive. Like, you know, you're, you're handsome or you're, uh, you're a genius or whatever. I delete all this. Mm -hmm. I, block, I block people who cross boundaries and try to initiate personal, a personal call. I do not allow social media to intrude on my private life or personal space in any way, shape or form. And I eliminate from my life and from, from my social media spaces anyone who misunderstood what my social media are for. My social media are for, my social media are announcement boards. I communicate. I am utterly uninterested in any other form of interaction, except, of course, uh, um, comments on the information which contain information in their own right. Mm -hmm. But I, I do not allow social media to become a part of, of who I am as a social being, as a personal uh, entity, as an individual, and so on and so forth. In other words, I do not allow them to become part of my personality. I allow them to become part of my history. Mm -hmm. And that's a very crucial distinction. I can post on social media. I'm having a lecture on Sunday, which I am. That I will do. Mm -hmm. But I will not allow on this post any comments that have nothing to do with the lecture, with the subject of the lecture, etc., etc., or that have little to do with it, or that have to do with me personally. So I sterilize my social media. Mm -hmm. And is that a good way to use, is that basically an example of how to use it in a non-narcissistic way, is to just put out information if people interact with you, um, about that information, you can communicate with them, but anything outside those boundaries, you just get rid of that. Is that is that a great example of how to use it in a non-narcissistic way? I think social media have a deleterious, dangerous effect on any form of personal interaction. Mm -hmm. Even when two, when two people start off as friends, real friends, and communicate via social media, they end up fighting. They end up being aggressive. They end, I mean, it, uh, social media ends up contaminating and polluting even real-life friendships. I've witnessed that I don't know how many times. Social media is not built for personal communication because it was constructed and designed by schizoids, by loners. It is, it is atomizing. It separates us. It does not put us together. It brings the worst in us to the surface. It... It destroys and poisons anything human, anything personal, anything real, anything intimate. It should be avoided like the plague. It is, however, an extremely, used to be at least, until it was, until it was compromised by advertising. But it used to be a very efficient way to disseminate information instantly to a big group of people. And that's more or less it. And for these people, maybe to express some basic sentiments, like, like, don't like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's it. We have taken social media and tried to use it in ways that it was never meant to be used. And this was egged on by executives in these companies because it brought in a lot of money. But these, these platforms were never used, were never meant to be used as, for example, tools for communicating emotions, as tools for creating intimacy, as tools for maintaining relationships. They were never, ever meant to be used this way. Twitter was limited to 140 characters. And, and it's clear that it was not meant to be used as anything but a tool for disseminating basic information. Mm -hmm. And the same, the same goes for Facebook. Facebook was constructed as a bulletin board. At the time, there was, there was something called bulletin boards. It was constructed as a bulletin board for rich, uh, spoiled, white students. It was not meant to. It took, a, it took on a life of its own and kind of 
it, it's uh, the technology defeats itself. It's it's not built for that. It's not meant for that. Mm-hmm. Take for, take for take for instance the the very fact that on Facebook you can have five thousand friends. Yeah. <laughs> if Facebook was really about friendship and about real life friends, why not limit the number to two? Why not limit the number to twenty? Mm-hmm. How many people in the world have twenty real friends? You know what? Two hundred with acquaintances. Mm-hmm. How many people have two hundred? How many people have 5,000? It's clearly bullshit. What what Facebook says is bullshit. Mm. No one has 5,000 friends. So these are not friends. These are eyeballs. And uh, so if this, if social media were really about social interactions, they would have been designed utterly differently. Utterly. Mm. You look at the design and you learn about the purpose. There was a big argument during the medieval Middle Ages. And people were saying, what, is the, what was the intention of God? And one of, the, one of the arguments was, well, you look at what God had done, what, look at what God did, what he created, to understand the mind of God. And even in the Bible, they say that man was created in the image of God. You know, Look at the creation to understand the mind of its creators. If a designer allows you to have 5,000 friends, clearly the word friends is misleading, perhaps criminally misleading, because false advertising is a criminal offense. Mm. It's interesting, Sam, what you were saying just just a a little bit earlier in this uh, last reply. Because you said that, that social media isn't being used how it was intended to be used. So that would leave, lead me to believe that these arguments that these heads of these different social media companies are making, that while it's taken a life of its own, it's, this isn't what it was meant to be, that they can then justify that and say, well, no, but this isn't how it was meant to be. People weren't supposed to be aggressive. People weren't supposed to be emotional. So is it then fair for them to defend themselves in that way? No, of course not. Huh. Because um, the platforms were designed as they were, but once the platforms began to be used in a specific uh, unsavory way, mm-hmm. all these executives jumped on the bandwagon and provided the new junkies with drugs. <laughs> it's like a pusher saying, like a drug uh, pusher saying, listen, um, cannabis was meant to be used for medical purposes. But since suddenly uh, 20,000 people came to my door asking for, for uh, recreational use, I started to sell them drugs. It's not my fault. They wanted it. The executives in Facebook, and I'm um, mentioning Facebook, but it's not, not limited to Facebook, of course. Executives in, uh, in uh, Instagram and other places. The minute they realize that the platforms are being used in a highly specific way, idiosyncratic way, they didn't say, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's build tools to reverse the process. Let's build tools to prevent this from happening. There's too much aggression. Let's build tools to avoid aggression. There's too much narcissism. Let's, uh, let's limit the technology so that it fights narcissism back. Let's, um, you know, for example, let's put emphasis on content, not on empty likes. Let's, put, uh, let's, let's uh, moderate like they're doing now. They are being forced to moderate now, 15 years later. So let's moderate. Let let us ban people who are aggressive. Let I mean, there were so many policy choices to keep the original nature had they wanted to. But when they discovered that aggression is addictive, they provided you with tools to be aggressive. When they discovered that you can be conditioned and they can monopolize your, monopolize your time, they made the technology to condition you and to to play on your addictive personality. I mean, they acted with malice to leverage all the sick, pathologized aspects of you that came to the surface. They brought out the worst in you, not the best in you. They could have easily 
absolutely easily made different policy choices and create a truly, a true social platform for real life, meaningful, contentful social interaction. And I'm telling you that this existed before social media. Before social media came on the scene, which is about 2006, there were hundreds of thousands of people interacting on forums, on bulletin boards. There was something called IRC. There were channels for thousands of people to talk to each other. I, I had a group, a support group, with 250,000 members, and so on. So there, it's not true that social media was the first to leverage interactions of millions of people. Millions, tens of millions of people were interacting with each other long before social media. But they were doing it in a civilized, content-oriented, tolerant way. Mm -hmm. And when people, when people overstepped the line, when they became aggressive, when they were trolling, when they were uh, uh, off point, moderators stepped in and either banned them and blocked them or rectified their behavior, remedied it by deleting posts if necessary. So social media, when it came on the scene, was meant to be a variant of this, a bulletin board. But the only innovation was that there was no moderator. So it was a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer bulletin board. And then they discovered amazing things. The more aggressive people are, the more sticky they are, the more they stay, you know, glued to the screen. Great. Let's give them tools to be more aggressive. The more envious they are, the more they post, the more they monitor other users, the more the eyeballs are ours. Great. Let's give them tools to be envious. The more empty the interaction, the more addicted they become because it's pathological narcissism. Great. Let's make the interactions totally content-free, vacuous, so that they become addicted, so that they don't pay attention to their families or anything else, so that we can monetize their eyeballs. Don't you see? These were policy choices to enhance sickness because sickness guarantees eyeballs, attention, and attention can be monetized mm -hmm. at the expense of everything else. I keep giving this example. If you have a girlfriend and if you have Facebook, Facebook will do everything in its power to separate you from a girlfriend because your girlfriend competes with Facebook for advertising money. It's very simple. Why pretend otherwise? Facebook needs you to look at the screen. If you are doing anything else, it's bad for Facebook. Mm -hmm. So do you basically think that now when they talk about all these things they're trying to do to stop the kind of you know, negative behavior that you see on social media and it, them explaining that it isn't that easy but they're working on it, that's all actually not true. And what they're really doing is they're looking at this stuff and thinking, actually, this is, as you say, putting eyeballs on the screen. They don't want to lose that. They have to tell the public that they are trying to do something about it because there's such a negative backlash from it and also the political pressure, as you mentioned. But really, they, they would ideally like to keep it the way it is because it's making them the most money. If social media were not challenged by lawmakers and others, they would have allowed the posting of ISIS beheading videos. Because ISIS beheading videos would have garnered tens of millions of views. They have no compunction, no morality, but the bottom line. There is no question about this. YouTube had allowed, um, had allowed videos by terrorist organizations for well over 11 years, without any form of censorship, none of these videos had been removed. I personally found videos of beheadings and worse on YouTube with millions of views. Mm. And by the way, <laughs> the irony is some of the hashtags were like beheading, 
or killing or you know yeah, yeah. what's the problem <laughs> to to write a single line of code if beheading then delete but for 11 years you had beheading videos on youtube they still do by the way this is a policy choice. It's a technological uh, choice. It's not an accident. It's a mindset. So you can say, okay, so why why now they are trying to clamp to kind of uh, clamp on fake news and so well, for for two reasons. Uh, the heat is on, and these companies can face regulation or Antitrust, um, you know, they can be broken up. Google was threatened with being broken up. Facebook is not threatened with being bro broken up, as was Microsoft um, a decade and a half ago. So um, they are terrified of that. They're terrified of being broken up. They're terrified of regulation. They're terrified of people looking deeply into their operations because they haven't, because the malice the pseudo almost quasi criminal activity was not only up front it was in the back office as well we are now discovering that they were selling um, user data in a totally you know without any constraints to uh, to everyone including very personal user data so uh, what what went on behind the scenes was as bad as what went on what went on screen and they're terrified. They don't want anyone trying into their business because it's a swamp. I have no doubt, although I have no proof, that there were vast criminal undertakings there. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And um, so now, this is my final question, Sam, to sort of bring it back generally to the internet as well, maybe not just social media. Um, I've seen a quote from you where you've said, long-term exposure to the net um, has a beneficial effect um, and I just wanted to ask because obviously there's a lot of negative things that you can point out about it Well, what is the beneficial effect that long-term exposure to the net can have on the person? Well, I think um, We should not make the mistake that is very commonly made in uh, in Asia in Asia They confuse Facebook with the internet. So when they say internet, they mean Facebook. Yeah <clears throat> um, The internet is not Facebook mm -hmm. So you don't, see, you don't feel this way about social media? I'm sorry? So I was just going to say, so you don't feel this way about the positive effect about social media, it's more just about the internet itself, yeah? There, is not, there has not been a single positive effect of social media mm -hmm. ever documented in any of the numerous studies conducted. On the very contrary, um, scholars like Twenge and Campbell and numerous others, Zimbardo and numerous others, have proven conclusively over well over a decade that social media increases anxiety and depression, especially among teens, and is very powerfully correlated with the skyrocketing suicide rate among teens especially, but not only. There, I am not aware of a single one study that had demonstrated any positive effect of social media, of any kind. Um, that is shocking. Do you know why it's shocking? Because social media have a lot of money and academics are not immune to money where there is money you can always always find a, uh, a professor to hire for hire who will write glowing reports about about something so the tobacco industry had professors writing about the benefits of tobacco uh, the opioid industry Purdue had professors writing about or scholars or doctors writing about the benefits of opioids where there's a lot of money, there's always someone who will write a very positive report. And social media have a lot of money, billions of dollars. And yet they could not find a single academic, a single scholar, a single professor, or a single doctor, single psychiatrist, or single psychologist who would write anything positive about social media. Because the evidence is so overwhelming that no one would risk their career. Overwhelming that social media is a form of mass poisoning. Mm -hmm. It's utterly toxic sludge. There is not 
one positive psychological, positive aspect to social media. Not one that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Whereas the net, as in your quote, can have beneficial effects, that's, that's a different thing, the internet. So where are the beneficial effects from that? Is it basically just the, the kind of information you can find on there? Or? Mostly, yes. Mostly yeah. information. Well, listen, today you, can, you have access to, to millions of books online, free of charge. Mm. So you have access to archives of newspapers. You know, you have, you have, I mean, it's wonderful. It's uh, by far the biggest library um, uh, that has ever existed. And um, I'm not talking about... Uh, hackers that post, you know, new books. And, I mean, you can, mm. anything you want, you can find. Yeah. All the, yeah. all the, all the treasures of art and culture. I'm, I'm in love with the internet. I spend hours on the internet every day. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's like browsing the, the greatest library to have ever existed. Mm. Um, you can still find enclaves in forums and so on of like-minded people. Like-minded, not in the sense that they don't disagree with you. Like-minded, like interested people. Mm -hmm. The same interests. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can exchange useful useful uh, information. It's a, a great tool for scheduling and appointment making and, and so on, coordinating activities. For example, a lot of activism, political activism, environmental activism and so on, takes place through the internet. Um, and ironically, sometimes uh, they use social media, such as Twitter. Uh, but... The truth is that social media is used just to initiate processes. After that, it, it becomes real life, luckily. So, you know, um, YouTube, for example, is not social media. It's a common mistake. YouTube is not social media. It's a, it's a platform for dissemination of information. A lot of information is trivial or junk or trash and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's something else. That's the quality of uh, But YouTube, YouTube itself is technically not social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there, are, and I regard YouTube as, as, a, as a powerful, uh, a positive force, all in all, despite the, what I've mentioned before, that they didn't remove terrorist uh, videos. I gave that example, not because YouTube is a social media medium, mm -hmm. but because uh, technology companies in general uh, are focused on eyeballs, mm -hmm. whether they are social media or not. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many, I mean, I would say that most of the internet, with, with the except, exception of social media, most of the internet is a is a positive <coughs> force. Of course, it is. Mm -hmm. So the so the, therefore, if is there a way that someone who's a narcissist, if they enter the internet, say for the first time, let's not include social media on in that, but do they enter the internet, they look around, they find things. Is there a way that can somehow improve them to be less narcissistic? Uh, or is it if they if they have you know that mentality, it won't make a difference. It would just kind of they'll find the things that make them more narcissistic. Or can is there some way that they can look through all the the gold that there is on the internet and actually that can change their perspectives in a positive way? Why would exposure to Encyclopedia Britannica change you as a narcissist? Mm -hmm. So so no hope. <laughs> no, I mean uh, not no hope and no connection. Yeah. What's uh, yeah okay. narcissists are. Um, Attention whores, they, they're addicted to attention because they need attention to regulate the sense of identity mm. and sense of self-worth. Uh, without attention, they crumble and disintegrate. So it's an existential need. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly like other junkies, because it's an addiction, they look at everything from the angle of, can I, get, can I obtain attention by using it? So even if they visit the Encyclopedia Britannica, they would probably be looking for some information that they can then post online mm. in order to garner likes. I mean, they Nazis look at everything via the lens of can I use it to obtain attention. Mm -hmm. So mm. there's no question of healing here. There's a they couldn't but, find but one again, of the. I say the internet is, is essentially a positive thing. If you go, I, I used to work in Africa, worked in Africa for four years. Mm. Ask any farmer in Africa and they will tell you uh, how the internet changed their lives. But for example, they now know they, are, they become aware of international prices, so they can price their commodities much better. I mean, uh, medicine, medicine is, has, been, has benefited enormously, and especially in remote places via the internet. Mm. I mean, internet is indispensable. It's a wonderful tool. I, I'm not... Anti-internet. Mm -hmm. I was an internet pioneer, actually. I owned the first internet company in Israel. Oh, wow. 
Um, I, I'm not I'm not against the internet. I wrote a series of articles in 1996 for PC Magazine on the future of the internet, where I predicted social media mobility. But I I've always been in a, in a board with uh, with the internet. I I'm in love with it. It's a great the greatest uh, platform ever. However, it's been hijacked. It's been hijacked by unscrupulous, uh, avaricious, greedy executives who then leverage human nature, the, the less savory aspects of human nature, to make money. Everything can be hijacked. Knives can be used to cut bread, to cut people. Internet has been hijacked. It's a hostage. Sam, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for spending an hour with me. Thank you very much for my answering pleasure. all my questions. Um, but yeah, thank you again, and, and I wish you a very good day today. Okay. So, so thank you again, Sam. Thank you um, for, for your time. Bye-bye.